Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Koshi, and I'd like to welcome you to the next lecture of the Modern Critical Theory Lecture Series on Queer Theory with Professor Sharon Holland. Sharon Holland is a graduate of Princeton University and holds a PhD in English and African American Studies from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She is the author of Raising the Dead, Readings of Death and Black Subjectivity, which won the Laura Romero First Book Prize from the American Studies Association in 2002. She's also co-author of a collection of transatlantic Afro-Native criticism with Professor Tia Miles entitled Crossing Waters, Crossing Worlds, the African Diaspora in Indian Country. And this came out through Duke in 2006. Professor Holland is also responsible for bringing a feminist classic, The Queen is in the Garbage by Leela Karp to the attention of the Feminist Press for publication. She's also author of the much cited The Erotic Life of Racism 2012, a theoretical project that explores the intersection of critical race, feminist and queer theory. She is currently at work on the final draft of another book project entitled simply Little Black Girl. Also in progress is her book project entitled Perishment, a theoretical study that takes German philosopher Martin Heidegger's notion that humans die while animals perish and reads across the theoretical spectrum of works on the human animal distinction in order to arrive at a fundamental question. What is the relationship of blackness to discourse on the animal? In addition to these two book projects, she is also co-editing a special double issue of GLQ with Kyla Tompkins and Marcia Ochoa entitled On the Visceral. Um, before I hand this over to Professor Holland, um, I just want to quickly go over how we're going to be doing the Q&A. As usual, we'll run it using the Q&A feature rather than chat. Um, and uh, Professor Holland will be lecturing for about 45 minutes, and then we will move to Q&A after the lecture. So be ready with your questions around that time. You can type it in at any point, uh, but she will be responding um, only at the very end of the lecture. So thank you all very much for joining us. And now here is Sharon Holland. Thank you, um, Susan. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And um, thanks. I wanna thank the Unit for Criticism and Interpretive Theory for the invitation to come to talk to you tonight. Um, it's always difficult when you're when someone tells you, I'd like you to talk about queer theory to try to figure out what text you should, you know, pick. Um, I do the same when someone asks me to talk about critical race theory of the thousands of texts that you could possibly engage, you know, what would you do that would be the most impactful? And so um, I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but I wanted to give you some background as to why I chose some of the readings for today. Um, all three authors, at least three of the authors that I chose, that would be Biddy Martin, um, <clears throat> Evelyn Hammonds, and Susan Stryker. Um, were writing and engaged in what was then called lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgender studies that was becoming queer studies sometime in 93, 94. And one of the things I do, I like to do when I'm teaching queer theory, which is usually not you know, actually often, um, I'm teaching queer theory mostly as a part of, you know, other engagements and attachments um, across um, feminist discourse and critical race theory and critical ethnic studies. But when I do engage queer theory, I like to keep myself honest. And I'm always searching for that moment um, for texts that, you know, remind me of what happened in the 90s that changed uh, what we were focusing on and why. And I always come back to this Biddy Martin um, text, the Biddy Martin text that I signed, and also um, the Evelyn Hammonds, um, besides the fact that they both have beautiful titles. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start. 
Um, I'm primarily looking at the Martin and Hammonds pieces and thinking about thinking of thinking with them together about the questions that they ask uh, about a quote unquote emerging um, queer theory. So I hope this assessment that I'm going to move through will be valuable to you. So Biddy Martin, sexualities without genders and other queer utopias. Now, wouldn't that be nice? I am worried about the occasions when anti-foundationalist celebrations of queerness rely on their own projections of fixity, constraint, or subjection onto a fixed ground, often onto feminism or the female body in relation to which queer sexualities become figural, performative, playful, and fun. I chose this quote um, for several reasons, maybe they might be obvious, but I'm interested always in the relationship of queer theory to black thought, critical race theory, um, to feminist theory. And I see in Biddy Martin's beginning assessments in sexualities without genders that there is a dichotomy set up in early queer theory between what the femme slash female body can or cannot do um, and what a certain kind of um, performative figural perhaps male queer body can do. And I'll move through that as I get down um, into uh, both essays. But I like this quote for how it grounds us. The next is from Evelyn Hammond. I never open a book about lesbians or gays with the expectation that I will find some essay that will address the concerns of my life. Speaking in 1994, Hammonds puts her finger on a particular problem in the field. And that is the invisibilizing of um, particular bodies um, of color. And what I'm interested in is the extent to which Martin speaks about a field of inquiry and Hammonds speaks about that field of inquiry, but from a very different location. And one that doesn't necessarily allow her to take very seriously some of the claims that it makes for gender or for sex, precisely because of some of its absences. And this is from Benavente and Gail Patterson's um, uh, reading of Susan Stryker's piece 2004 essay and reading in the GOQ um, you know, anniversary issue, writing in the GOQ anniversary issue from 2019, they note, the critique of queer theory's allegorization of trans people as the exceptional locus of gender trouble with its attendant separation of queer and trans categories still feels as relevant today as it was over a decade ago. So writing in 2019, both authors working in the field of, of trans studies, transgender studies, think about the extent to which queer theory allegorizes right, um, trans people as this exceptional locus. And that the, the thought that gender, the gender trouble that we thought we had, right? And I'm referencing Judith Butler here. Um, that we thought we had in the early 90s and how that trouble became troubling and manifested and manifested itself later is of great concern to them in this piece. And it strikes me that some type of a priori grounding is happening in queer theory so that it constantly projects itself onto, you know, for lack of a better term, 
a proper object, right? Or perhaps the most improper object. And so I'm interested in the play here, although I concentrate mostly on the Martin and the Hammond, I'm really interested in what's at stake in the turn from L slash G studies to queer. And so I'm hoping to map that out and reading these two pieces together. So I turn this question around a little bit. This question actually is, is, is um, not replicated from Hammond's, but usually one wants to, we wanna ask, we wanna put the pressure on bodies of color, on blackness, right? to think about the construction of sexuality. Um, and one of the things that Hammonds does is to say, well, what about white subjectivities? What about, what, what constructs a white subjectivity? And it seems as if in the Martin, we can't quite get to the term white. We can get to lesbian, um, we can get to black lesbian, but we don't necessarily have the, the the presence of whiteness as a racialized um, category. And so one of the questions um, that comes to the fore in thinking about queer theory and in thinking about that turn is that is sex, is sexuality a distinct social axis? So what I'm tracking here is what is the relationship among sex, gender, sexuality. Um, and I'm thinking of at a rigor, you know, which, you know, the sex which is not one, right? Which one of these things, these entities um, matters most? Um, <clears throat> and we'll see as I move through thinking through these categories that there's an undecidability um, in queer theory about what matters most, um, about what sexuality actually is. Um, there's actually great argument about that. And I'm gonna track it in this space between the Hammonds and the Martin. So Martin starts out by troubling some feminist um, um, tenants. The first one is that women, the insistence upon women over and against men as a grounding political experience for feminism, right? So this idea of the category women, the movement away from biological or psychological determinisms to, an, to analysis of the social strata and modes of, format, of formation, right? So we're not thinking about sex as biologically determined um, or the psychological determinisms that arise from it we're thinking about social strata and modes of formation, which are always already gender, not sex. The fixity of gender is similar for Martin to that of race, which is why early queer theory has had, has had such a tenuous and difficult relationship with those whose focus is on racial formation as a method of critique. So if we are trying to, to understand sex, if we are trying to understand gender, if we are trying to think sexuality, we need to formulate something as over and against the other. And so what happens with queer theory's arrival um, on the scene is that gender gets fixed in a particular kind of femaleness, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And in the same way that race is fixed, right, um, in feminist and queer analysis. And there's a way in which these, even though these two things are, have a fixity and are similar to one another, the way in which critics actually take them up matters matters differently. And one of the things I like about Martin's critique is that Martin moves through Sedgwick to try to figure out what Sedgwick is trying to say about sex gender, and then moves to Butler and to, to try to do the same thing. And I like 
reading Martin's piece because Martin reminds me, often I read feminist scholars on other feminist scholars, queer scholars on other queer scholars, because you get really lucid um, descriptions of the work and it can really help you kind of cut through swaths of, of theoretical language that at time can seem circular or embedded or you know not quite um, moving in the direction that you want it to move in if you're trying to extract something, and I don't like that term, but if you're trying to take something from it that might be useful to your work. Hammonds wants to trouble lesbian and gay studies. Remember, both of these pieces are written in the same year. Literally, one was written in differences and it dropped in the, in the summer, fall. The other was written in diacritics and it dropped in summer and fall. So these pieces are simultaneous. So Hammonds asks, can the shift from lesbian gay to queer resolve the silences and erasures of the pre-existing approaches to sex, gender, sexuality, right? So that's Hammonds' first question. Is it actually true that the paucity of material from writers and critics of color in the early iterations of the field was because these writers didn't identify as gay or they chose race over sex? And I think this is a really important moment because as Martin talks about in Sexualities Without Genders, we have a particular location of queer, which is not, which is in contradistinction to the fixity of, of, of lesbian femme gender, right? And that relationship then creates a structure within queer theory where we are always over and against, which therefore replicates the structure of, um, of a certain kind of feminism that's under critique. Hammonds then says, silence around racial identity in LG studies is produced in the field as a lack of knowledge of one another. And so I love this moment in Hammonds because Hammonds reminds us, and it comes up in Biddy Martin when Martin's talking about knowledge, you know, that we don't, and Martin's actually, I think, not only talking about knowledge in their own piece, but actually quote, quote, quoting Teresa de Laurentiis, in saying that we'd have to know more about folks who are out there. And I think this is a contestation that has been in black feminism for a long time. What is it that you're pretending not to know today, right? Um, and so what happens is that this idea of knowledge becomes personal and experiential rather than a structured, rather conscious forgetting. Um, and I wanna frame this in a, in a particular example here. Um, in this day of reparations, you know, I see many people um, of, um, you know, who are phenotypically white or culturally white um, relating, relating to their own, having their own relationship to property and land in this kind of angst filled way and which can be very public um, on, on Facebook. You know, I just got this money. I just bought this land. I inherited the money or what have you. And there's a performance that goes along with that about like, you know, all of the things that go into occupying that land, buying that land, having property. But the thing that's left out, right? And this is where, this is a dichotomy between the personal and experiential, rather structured, right? Rather than the structural. The thing that's left out in that performance of personal angst is the real structural indebtedness that white subjects have to, of reparations and a re to reparations and reterritorialization, right? That that transfer of wealth is precisely the thing that produces knowledge, right? But the obfuscation that that you know I would have to know more. The obfuscation here is personal and experiential, so that we can ignore the structural claim that doing that in and of itself is perhaps an unethical turn, right? And so Hammonds returns me to that moment in, in, in queer studies, you know, in queer theory early on of uh, willful forgetting of the positionality of whiteness um, 
and uh, you know as a particular kind of knowledge over and against um, other forms of knowledge. And then one of the things that Hammonds takes from Butler here is that vectors of power like racism, homophobia, and misogyny require and deploy one another. Once again, if they require and deploy one another, then our analysis would have to match that requirement and that those the modes, yeah, the, the, the modes of requirement um, and the spaces in which they're de deployed together. And I feel like Hammond's, I mean, um, Martin really gets at this when she talks about all of the corrections um, that are deployed by audience members at a conference um, in the piece that you know she recounts, um, where they're saying, well, the butch and the femme are not just about gender play. The butch and the fan are also about race. Um, and that um, colleagues you know, on the dais and in the audience can't seem to wrap their heads around that sim simultaneity or unpack it. White feminists must refigure white female sexuality so that they are not theoretically dependent upon an absent yet ever present pathologized black female sexuality. And so, you know, one of the questions that I, you know, one of the things that always comes up in, in early forms of, you know, lesbian theorizing and that then become queer theorizing is that so many of these butch femme relations um, are um, cut through with the black butch, right, and and the phenotypically white femme. And I keep saying, thinking to myself, what if those positionalities were reversed? How would we read black? How would we read black femme? How would we read um, butchness um, in, in, in particular ways? And so I think what Hammonds returns us to is that if we don't do the reading required, and that's not you know, knowledge production you know, or edification, if we don't literally do the reading of the scene that the scene requires, then we place blackness in a static or fixed role. Um, in relationship to the very kind of queer subject subjects and queer theoretical um, capaciousness that we actually are trying to achieve um, in our writing as theorists. Martin says that queer theory necessarily celebrates transgression in the form of visible difference from norms that are then exposed to be norms, not nature's inevitabilities. Surfaces then take priority over interiors and depths. I think this is probably one of the most important moments in Biddy Martin because it cuts across a range of particular problems that I see in queer theorizing both early on and that pretty much endure um, into this present moment where you know certain forms of queer theorizing are you know taking on um, the contours of black pessimism and thinking really about forms of anti-blackness, right? And so if queer theory necessarily ce celebrates transgression, right? Then this mode of celebration, this mode of the transgression has always got to name um, um, something grounding and founding that then can be um, disidentified with or that then can be deployed as abject or you know, that thing we no longer do, right? The second thing that goes on that's going on here is that this form of visible difference, right, privileges surfaces, right? And I understand that visible differences, you know, challenge, you know, norms as norms, not nature's, not inevitabilities. But it does, in a sense, go to surface. And we therefore lose the ability to think interiors or depths. And the way this lines up so beautifully with Hammonds for me is in Hammonds is theorizing in black holes, the idea of, um, you know, derived from their work as a scientist, um, as, as, a, as a physicist, to think about what the black, the depth and the contours of what a black hole actually is in and of itself. Um, and so I think that this priority over interiors and depths um, allows us to understand and see um, performance as, in, um, as, a, as, a, as a certain form of ideological constraint for us as theorists. 
And one of the things, you know, I, I take this from Toni Morrison's work that I'm interested in as a theorist is I'm interested in the loan. I'm interested in the thing that cannot be seen. I'm interested in the psychic life um, of, of something. I'm interested in rememory. And so those interiors and depths, I wanna know not only what you're doing, but why to yourself you're doing it. And I think that Biddy Martin gets us there um, if we read her alongside um, Hammond's work. And so um, at one point, Biddy, Biddy Martin asks, what is the language we have available for thinking about selves and others? And I think about that all the time, especially as, as someone who does work in animal studies and is thinking about, you know, um, hum animal and animal life in particular. And the notion that there is a language that is articulate enough, that is, that is, that is, art, I don't wanna say articulate enough. The notion that there is a language that can adequately capture, or actually, should I say, should capture selves and others. One of the things I'm interested in here is that binary that continues to produce, um, like I said, the same quandary um, that feminism produces. If we're doing something over and against, then the thing that we are against must be cast out, right? And what if we are casting out the very quote unquote thing that is the most vulnerable component of the politics we want to inhabit? So, this is Martin thinking through Sedgwick, and Martin thinks through Sedgwick, and then and then Butler. So I've got these two slide these two uh, slides that I want to want to mount here to really think about um, how the feminist project meets a burgeoning discussion of sexuality. So the feminist part. This is what the feminist project is. It charts a space between sex and gender. We're not really sure what that space is. You know, some have 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 thought of it as uh, 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 both sides of the same coin. Others have construed it as particularly, you know, marked by difference, right? Um, the feminist project downplays biological sex, right? The determinism of bi biological sex, right? And um, is satisfied um, and moves in favor of social constructions of gender, right? And I rehash all these moments because many of us might know these moments, but um, we might not necessarily um, think about how they're deployed um, for the usefulness of an, an emerging queer theory in the mid nineties. The central issue in, in gender differentiation and gender struggle is the question of who is to have control of women's distinctive reproductive capacity, and, I'm sorry, capability. I think that this is a signal moment in not only Sedgwick's work, which Martin picks up on, but also in feminist work. We were very careful in feminism to mark reproduction as the sphere of the control of women. And because we marked reproduction as the sphere of control of women, then we, sent, we eschewed it in some way, shape or form. Um, and decided that it's too messy to think about gender in terms of the reproductive capacity, the biological sex, right? Um, of uh, folks who are assigned female, not only assigned female at birth, but have the cap capability um, um, for, to, to, to have embodied um, children. For me, this moment, which is a 1990, you know, 19, 1993 moment in Biddy Martin, but actually harkens back to Cedric's work from an earlier period, which is at the same time, obviously, that Spillers drops Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American grammar book, that's 87, right? Spillers is actually wanting to think through reproduction because it is a signal node of intervention in theorizing the transatlantic um, um, slave trade, in theorizing what slavery and enslavement was and meant. 
And so one of the differences I see here that I can offer is in thinking about this move away from reproduction, right? And not really thinking about um, um, thinking about you know the the female, right? One of the things that Martin says is that we kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater by thinking outside by moving away from reproductive capacity. We therefore assign reproductive capacity to this retrograde female, this retrograde feminine, which then becomes a problem not only within queer theorizing but within actually feminist theorizing. One of the things too that Martin points out in Sedgwick's work is that sexuality, which is indicatively male in Sedgwick, then becomes the practice performance that exceeds the bare choreographies of procreation, right? Again, it's set up so very clearly in Sedgwick that the, the play, the work of queer identity um, in, in its practices and performance is set up um, in contradistinction to um, choreographies of, of procreation and contradistinction of, to this reproductive node. Um, and the reason why I'm interested in the reproductive node is because it comes through in black thought as a very different entity than it comes through in feminist thought. In black thought, the reproductive node is, um, represents a certain kind of future, not the future embedded in a feminism that sees reproductive, the re re reproduction as the end all and be all of being. Um, um, itself for women, but in thinking about reproductive uh, uh, re reproduction and reproductive capacity as the promise of a future forestalled, right, for blackness, and so the consideration of of of, temp of temporality itself, or the consideration of temporality itself and blackness, works over and against in some ways, these modes of repudiating um, reproduction in the sphere of, of queer theory um, and feminist theorizing. And so that's just uh, one moment we can talk about it in the question and answer, but I'm really curious about that. Um, and I uh, talk a little bit about it in this next book project I've been working on. So this sense that this autonomous, playful, you know, capacity of queer is set up against um, the fixity of gender coded as female, right? The fixity of race um, coded as identity, right? Um, produces um, a particular enveloping, um, and an envelopment um, within our work that then deploys, that, that then allows us to understand why we need to always already be thinking about what's transgressive as opposed to be thinking about what happened here, right? Um, Hammond's project, is an historical project grounded in, in an expression of black sexualities. Black females is the embodiment of sex, all that is not white, right? And this goes back to conceptualizations, you know, traced out by Hortense Spillers, traced out by so many, you know, Audre Lorde, traced out by so many um, black feminist authors and writers of the extent to which a black female represents everything and nothing at all, right? Resistance of black women to negative stereotypes, right? This kind of active resistance to negative stereotypes that goes on in, um, in, in black feminist um, um, work that doesn't necessarily have the same corollary. Or I would say if it has a corollary in feminism, it moves against woman as that private sphere reproductive entity, right? And so, one of the things that Hammonds points out is that our very objects are a bit different, 
and our ver the 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 kind of labor that we do um, to clear the ground in order to do the work that we want to do um, as Black feminist scholars is a very different kind of clearing. And the third note here is the evolution of a culture of dissemblance and our politics of silence. This is something that definitely comes to the fore in Black feminist thought among Black um, um, legal theorists like Higginbotham and historians and like um, Darling Clark Hine. Um, this idea that we either produced a politics of silence, right? And, um, you know, uplifted the cult of true womanhood and respectability, or we participated in modes of dissemblance, um, you know, to, you know, deflect attention away from, you know, sexuality's drag um, um, for us as racialized others. And so again, I think, you know, one of the, the, the theorists that gets the closest to really thinking about what that drag is, um, and I mean drag more in the Derridian sense um, than in the kind of classic, you know, um, queer, you know, um, LGBTQ drag performance. And the, the person who gets closest to this is obviously Spillers um, in thinking about what this dissemblance, what this silence has wrought for us um, as um, Black, cisgender Black women who identify as such and as Black feminist theorists trying to theorize those embodied positionalities. Also, obviously, which, um, the simultaneous internal policing of sexuality against proper norms, right? So this idea that these, they, these, these moments are internalized um, for us in, um, in, in, doing feminist, in doing feminist work, right? And this internalization speaks to a, a critique um, about how sexuality is deployed within blackness. And this is something that really interests me. It seems as if the critique in Hammond is capacious enough to both engage a critique of, and my dog's barking, so if you can hear it, I'm sorry, um, is a critique of um, feminism, right? Is a critique of black feminism and black feminist critics and an enunciation of their differences, right? And we don't necessarily see that same kind of relationship to community in Biddy Martin's work. And I think this is really important here because if you are looking um, in Martin, you know, this critique, this, you know, there's no, there doesn't seem to be a public critique, right? of a kind of oppositional, um, an, an opposition be, you know, there doesn't seem to be a public critique of, you know, gay male critics, although there are some in other forms of queer theory, don't get me wrong. There doesn't, it seems as if she assiduously avoids that kind of critique. And instead there's a more deliberate, um, um, desire to be in conversation. But instead of thinking of this in Martin's work as more generous than say what Hammond is trying to offer, what I'd actually like to say is that that very generosity is predicated upon a field of sameness, not difference. And what I mean by that is that that, that generosity extends itself to a group of folks who consider themselves as peers who are not necessarily making interventions, but are tracking the existence of something that they therefore own. Hammonds is actually talking about having to, having to intervene on so many fronts, the clearing of ground in order to have the conversation, the correction of myths prevailing in one's own community, community and then the actual discussion of sexuality itself. And so I think um, what is being discussed, what can be, be discussed and how the critique unfolds is really important to the kind of space each critic takes up in an embodied way. Biddy Martin remarks, if the butch threatened the move, 
les to move lesbianism in the direction of a male male identification, then feminists threaten to move lesbianism in the direction of heterosexual betrayal, right? And um, Martin comes to this moment because of their work on butch femme and how you know butches move us you know away from the female um, and feminist because of its passing qualities moves us into allegiances with heteronormativity and with heterosexual heterosexuality because femmes are not always already marked you know as as lesbians um, in in this in this in this um, in the visual uh, in visual public arrangements. One of the things that Hammond says that I think is so generative in this essay is that what emerges from thinking through queer theory and black feminist relationship to queer theory, black, sex, black forms of quote unquote female women's sexuality, what emerges is a situation in which black women's sexuality is ideologically located in a nexus between race and gender. And I think this is crucial because black women's sexuality mediates this space and it probably there's no better articulation of that um, then, um, you know, in, in, in its beginnings and then in some of the Black feminist work that draws upon Spiller's work. And I'm thinking McKittrick, um, I'm thinking, you know, Jackson um, here. Just a question for us to hold. Maybe we can talk about it later. How did a complex expression of gender and lesbian praxis get flattened and opposed to what was considered to now be queer? One of the things that Martin is asking, and I think this is crucial, is that in, in, in posing one, that butch and femme exists in whiteness, and two, and then posing another question that butch and femme actually are articulated in a racialized ordering. One understands then butch and femme as oppositions that don't have in and of themselves positionalities that are in contradiction, contradiction to the very thing that either category represents. And so what Martin is saying is that we don't necessarily allow butch and femme to do anything other than what we allow them to do for us in this early moment. Um, and it goes to that difference between surface and death. I think that she's talking about, and certainly that Hammonds is gesturing toward um, in her utilization of black hole as a trope um, for thinking about both what we what we common understandings right of um, certain positionalities and kind of how they actually function and work in the world, um, and then. One of the questions here is for whom is symbolic power even a tool that can be bandied about? Um, and so she moves through this feminist project, um, thinking through Butler. So we thought about Cedric for a while and now Martin is thinking, if in Cedric the binary division between feminism and sexuality is upheld in sex gender, then in Butler the category of sex gender is repudiated and contested. In this regard, Butler focuses on the dynamic interplay of what is considered to be embodied gender, sex, identification, and desire. So Butler's work gets us a little bit closer to that dynamism between perhaps butch and femme, right? What can be articulated um, inside that relationship that isn't necessarily an opposition of binaries, right? Or oppositional. This performativity, um, the binary gender and sexual norms contingent, uh, is contingent and historically constituted. Um, and the body is not irrelevant, but now capable of representations that exceed binaries connecting it and giving it the capacity to redistribute symbolic authority and roots of desire. Which goes back to my earlier, the question right before here is for whom is symbolic power even a tool that can be bandied about, right? So the question left open for um, Evelyn Hammonds who wants to move away from psycho a psychoanalytic project, right? is the notion that symbolic power can, can ever be um, arranged or maintained or captured um, by black embodied 
um, folks. So the Black Feminist Project for Hammonds, and I'm close to the end here, focused somewhat exclusively um, um, on heterosexuality, right? Was negotiating institutionalized forms of invisibilizing, right? So and even to make the ground upon which one can speak, one has to clear it, right? So that the speaking can take place. So it's almost as if what you want is, you know, kind of a triptych article. You want the clearing of the ground, you want the, the laying out of the argument, and then you want its various contestations, right? And it's not often space given to um, um, Black feminist theorists, at least not in this 1994 iteration. Um, um, this idea, this Black feminist project always thinks about us as we move in these larger communities that we inhabit, that we have to answer to, and that we're also all, not always already figured in, um, in ways that are acceptable to us or palatable to us or um, allow for us to be seen. Um, so for Hammonds, the danger is from within and without rather than a danger articulated in a unidimensional way. And this gets back to what Hammonds um, um, is trying to, 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 to bring forward um, and the positionality that she must inhabit in order to do that work and the kind of work that Martin is able to do um, as someone who considers himself um, as an interlocutor as opposed to this idea as Hammond's moves forward with in the piece um, of um, Sister Outsider, right, for Modulo's work. And again, um, one of the things, you know, despite the fact that Spillers and Horton Spillers and Claudia Tate, um, and uh, there's some, uh, forgotten uh, a name now, but uh, I'll remember it, I'm sure, in the question and answer. There's been uh, several um, Black psychoanalytic critics. Um, Hammond still wants to challenge the psychoanalytic as a primary framing for desire and sexuality itself. And I think that that message has come through loud and clear, um, you know, in the 20, almost 20 years, uh, almost you know, over 20 years since the publication of these essays, but it's still something I think we're grappling with. I'm just going through some of my slides here because they, you know, this is the poster from She Must Be Seeing Things and the, the film that Biddy Martin's talking about. I like this question in Hammonds and I'll end, I think, I think this is my last slide, yes. Would the mere black women hold up to themselves and to each other provide access to the alternate sexual, alternative sexual universe within the metaphorical black hole? And so I think, what Hammonds is speaking to there is um, the relationship of Black feminism and Black feminist inquiry to uh, uh, emerging um, queer, queer studies um, that takes as its object a kind of capacious self and wants to leave behind you know, the drag of female, the drag of race. And we can see that fervent desire as, as um, queer theory develops over time. And so thank you for being such a um, um, gracious audience. And I think I'll stop sharing and then perhaps we can go to question and answer. Dr. Koshi. <laughs> um, thank you so much uh, for that talk. That was wonderful. Um, I think um, we can move to Q&A. And for those of you in the audience, um, please hit the Q&A tab and type in your questions there. And um, then we can get started um, on the discussion. 
Um, but you know, while we're waiting, um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your current book project um, on um, the, 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 the human animal. Yes, um, yes. Divide. Yes, I'm um, sure. Um, I, the, pro the project is now entitled, um, it's moved so far away from its, its, its iteration as perishment. That was kind of in the beginnings and then it became vo vocabularies of vulnerability. Um, and then as I tell people when I'm talking about the project, I, I fell off a horse. Um, or I was bucked off of a horse, which is to be not so politely deposited on the ground. And I broke. And it was in that moment that I began to think about vulnerability very differently. And I began to think of vulnerability not as a particular form of precarity, but a form of, of, of ethical relation. Um, and so the new project is called and Other, A Black Feminist Consideration of Animal Life. And um, I moved through all manner of registers um, to really think about um, and to think with um, animal life. Um, and so, you know, I look at the, the near hanging scene in 12 Years a Slave and the beating of the enslaved woman Patsy by her friend and even confidant in both novel and film, 12 Years a Slave. I moved from there to think about flesh and the abattoir and um, to think about the difference between Spillers and, and, um, and Morrison and, and take up Merleau-Ponty and obviously forms of black pessimism. I moved through the MOVE archive and thinking about their, their, atom, their animal liberation stance and um, its contributions to thinking about life as a single referent. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I move to thinking about um, Haraway and Vicki Hearn and training and um, the great apes and um, the film Equilibrium, actually. <laughs> and then I think about um, um, the films of Charles Burnett, too, in particular, The Horse, and um, the other one, which is um, Killer of Sheep. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do in the, pro and then I think about equestrian cultures and what I am terming equestrian literature and the subject position of black folks at the center of the creation of the sport of racing mm -hmm. and the hunt seat and um, the, um, as opposed to the, you know, you know, we were involved, obviously a lot of people know in, in the Western seat, but they don't know very much about, you know, our relationship to the, the hunt seat um, equestrian culture. And so what I try to do is return, what I try to make an argument for in the book is both historical and also theoretical. And that is, is that if we erase the moments in which black life formed ethical relation mm -hmm. um, with, with other forms of animal life, then we do not allow ourselves to see black life in its fullest iteration and in its ethical relationship, you know, um, right around the seventies, you know, you have these two films, you got Move, you got all these folks, you got Dick Gregory, all of them really interested in thinking about animal liberation and animal life. And so I wanna bring them back into the discourse in animal studies. Mm -hmm. And I wanna produce a feminist analysis. And I talk a lot about reproduction in the book. That sounds fascinating. Um, we, we, have, uh, we have the questions coming in, so um, let's sort of get started. Um, the first question is from Mitchell Civello. Um, thank you for your great lecture. I was wondering if you could share what, in your estimation, are some of the things that queer theory could learn from critical race theory or Black feminism about interiority? Mm. That's such a great question, Mitchell. Thank you. Um, you know, someone went, you know, after Toni Morrison um, died, you know, there's so many, there's so much, uh, there's a lot of work, you know, a lot of folks talking about her work and her contribution. And I think it's like, you know, it's, it's pretty much considered um, standard form now that we understand that Morrison gave us our interiority. Um, she, she, in her writing, um, you know, gave us an inside that we didn't have um, 
as a people. We had it for ourselves, right? But that pe she gave us something that we could get reflected us to ourselves. And then she also gave a gift to you know non-African descended peoples um, by holding up a mirror. And so one of the things that they can that we can get from critical race theory from forms of black feminism, and although you know, I wouldn't say that Morrison, you know, thought of herself as a black feminist, you know, I see so many of her characters as, you know, definitely worthy of black feminist analysis, and there has been a lot, right? But you know, I think the thing that I that I take most from critical race theory is the the phrase racism is ordinary. Um, and I think forms, one of the things we can take from understanding and engaging you know, manifestations of black life and discussions of black life in queer theory is to think very deeply about um, spectacularity, to think very deeply about the quotidian um, and how we engage um, the everyday and not, you know, not as a form that it has been engaged in as less than, you know, if I'm looking at the everyday, I'm looking at those people over there, but as a form, as, you know, as a way of thinking about practices like racism and, and their intersectionality, racism, heter heterosexism um, and sexism, right? Um, and, in, and homophobia, um, as a way of thinking about those experiences as um, casual, almost banal. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we, uh, once we do that, then we understand that they're part, of, then we understand that thing that Judith Butler's trying to get at when you know, she says, these things inform one another. But somehow whenever we, we'll say that in a sentence as theorists and then we move away from it and therefore create a spectacularity. And you know, it, we need to stay with the banality of the existence of violence among us. Okay. Um, I want to see if um, uh, we we have uh, we can at least allow the people who ask the question to respond. So um, and ask a follow up. Yeah, um, so Mitchell. Um, do you want to follow up with a question or do you want to just go right ahead? Should we just move ahead? Um, no, that, that was a great answer. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, so the next question is from Brienne Hayes. Um, the invocation of biology has become a red flag mm -hmm. for me in discussions of gender because of how Viciously, it's employed as a weapon against trans people. However, I also understand that the embodied differences of race, ability, and sex are crucial to how we conceptualize gender. How can we think about the imbrication of biology with sex, gender, and race without buying into the transphobic narrative of biological determinism? Well, I think, thank you. Um, um, is it Brienne? Yes. Is, is that, yeah, okay, Brienne. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I too, interestingly enough, have always eschewed, you know, talking about biology. But, you know, as you, first off, I'll say there's two books out there that I want to recommend if you don't haven't already read them. That's obviously um, Mel Chen's Animacies. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, late at night, I just forgot the second book. <laughs> animacies and oh and um uh terry pickens um mad blackness black madness right i think both of these books really try to do exactly what you're asking us to do which is thinking you can think about embodied embodied and i wouldn't even say embodied difference you can think about embodied being through race, ability, sex, without closing yourself off um, in the world of biological determinism, right? 
Um, and I feel like the way in which black feminist scholars right now, um, you know, um, Jennifer Nash just dropped a book about black motherhood. Um, the way in which black feminist scholars are thinking about motherhood right now is dynamic and it's embodied. And, you know, as you and I both know that, you know, doesn't matter what you're assigned at birth, the ability to, you know, who you become and how you embody another, right? In the, in, 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 um, in the production of life, right? Um, isn't about biological determinism so much it is it is about, and it's not even about capacity, although clearly it's been termed like that by the scientific community, but it really does have to do with ideologies around race and the imbrication of race and gender and sex that have to do with a community survivance. And so I think, you know, the reason why, you know, I feel like the reason why people are really thinking through this, you know, and it's come to me is the extent to which if you look at the MOVE archive, if you look at even the recent um, um, the taking of the bones of MOVE children um, and using them for academic study as opposed to returning them to their families. And, you know, somebody texted me, a black feminist critic and friend texted me, this world just can't seem to let them move mothers alone, right? And um, to thinking about not mother is not capacity um, and mother is not female, but to think about mother as a temporality that um, produces a future um, that a group of people might want to engage with is a much more um, interesting way to think about these, these entities outside of um, um, a kind of biological determinism. So I hear you, I hear you on that. And I think these scholars, you know, if you look at Nash, if you look at Chen, and if you look at um, Pickens, you, you're gonna find such rich territory there. For this we actually, conversation, we actually had Pickens uh, give the lecture last week. I oh my gosh! Read, I had we read. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't even. Yeah. I thought. I thought I saw who was here last week. I thought. Oh, you know what? I look. I think that's uh, Kaylan and Kaunai. Is yeah, that's next week. Coming. Next week. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes. Well, you have already been there, done that, right? <laughs> been there, done that. And she actually mentioned your work when she was lecturing. So there's this nice kind of. Uh, Yes, yes, most definitely. As a matter of fact, I had a little uh, piece in here about their work and I saw I was running out of time. So I'm so glad for that question. It's an excellent question. Um, Brienne, do you wanna, do you have a, do you have anything else to add to your question or should we move on? Um, I, I don't have any follow-up question. Um, I really, really appreciate uh, your your beautiful answer, uh, 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 Dr. Holland. And, and I'm I, sorry if I if I'm sounding a little uh, insert adjective here. I, it's been a difficult week for me, and I'm feeling very emotional. And though this has been a uh, uh, you know this this whole, I just want to say that these these readings that you, that you've selected and 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 your talk this evening have have really been tremendously helpful to me and also deeply informative and challenging in a way that I, I don't think I was prepared to be challenged. Um, and I, I find myself now think, asking, as, as this kind of started with the, as, as Dr. Koji mentioned with the, the reading of, of uh, Tree Pickens book uh, uh, last week um, and now moving into uh, this week and just having to consider things I hadn't considered before. Uh, about myself and about sort of how, uh, you know, notions of my identity play into the much broader social fabric of the world we live in. Uh, I, 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 th I think that trans people nowadays, we have to walk a very, especially trans people who are engaged in, in theory, have to walk a very difficult line between the theoretical and the political, uh, mm -hmm. where the theoretical allows us to ask many challenging questions and to call into question many things taken that like taken for granted, whereas on the political front, we have to be very hard line about certain things in order just to convince mm -hmm. others of the legitimacy of our existence. And so, uh, and I feel like I, I really, again, the, the, this, these, these readings have really 
uh, allowed me to think about that again and, and, and kind of allow, help me to, to reevaluate kind of where I fell, where I'm, where, where I, I find myself in that, that big sort of twist of priorities and ideas. So I just, again, I just want to say thank you so much. Oh, I, I so appreciate you and I so feel you. And I was, that's what, that's, that, that's exactly why I chose these readings. I feel like if, you know, sometimes it's nice to think about our future, but sometimes it's also nice, you know, as a, for myself as a non-binary person to kind of go back um, to um, that moment in 94 and to read Hammonds. And so Hammonds is actually in that split that you're talking about where, you know, Biddy Martin seems to be able to get, do the theory, quote unquote, and Hammonds has to handle the political and the theorizing, right? And so, you know, sometimes we're able to say things theoretically that don't really, you know, don't really, don't really move toward our protection in the political realm. And that is a really, you know, as my grandmother would say, that's a hard road to hoe and um, we have to do it. Um, and, you know, I'm up, I'm up for the challenging, the challenge, but I think that's what Hammonds is trying to say in their essay. Like people don't understand that how much ground I have to clear just to be able to say what I need to say and how it will be misinterpreted because people, not because people don't know, but because they're gonna forget that they know. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that you know, response. I really appreciate it. Um, the next question is from Sandra Ruiz. Um, thank you, Professor Holland for your brilliant lecture. <laughs> I've been waiting a long time to catch a glimpse of your genius life. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> How might we reconcile the ordinary brutalities of queer theory? Oh, wow, wow. Um, think outside that box, you know? Um, I would say, you know, I, I, you know, there's a moment, you know, and I've said this publicly, you know, and I'll say it here, um, you know, and I, and I, well, I already said it, I guess I said it in my book, The Erotic Life of Racism. You know, my whole intention, you know, in launching critique, you know, in my field, of my field at times, is not, you know, to produce something that might necessarily be better, but to get us to think about the fact that the terrain is so much bigger. You know, the disagreement in critical race theory is big and huge and interesting and fun and scrappy. And the disagreements within, you know, even something like, you know, queer color critique or, you know, in its relationship to other forms um, of, of critique, like black feminist um, work, or, you know, it depends on who you're following, right? It depends on who you land on to, to start um, your um, work. And the way we actually move against those brutalities is to constantly tell people, do not put me in a box. You know, and that's, I think Martin's doing, you know, Martin is, is, you know, I have great, Martin is one of my favorite critics and I have great respect for the fact that Martin is saying we're at surface and we're not thinking about interiority. We're not thinking about depth. We're not thinking about the very things that we deploy as binaries are also being performed over and against one another to great effect. And I think that the, ordinary brutalities are in that moment. And, you know, I've, I've said publicly, you know, while I'm not necessarily an Afro-pessimist, you know, I have great admiration for the work that it's doing in, in speaking to anti-Blackness and the ways in which um, these ordinary brutalities um, come, come forward as a kind of, you know, there's a moment in Wilderson where he says, this problem in the ontology is and and the the extent to which theorists certain theorists have utilized the ontology to move in certain directions has pro has produced a false conceptualization of being or a category of being that others cannot many cannot participate in and for this fault those critics must answer and there's still silence right that they think we're still having a different conversation when quite frankly, many critics don't understand that the conversation changed. So I wanna turn that around. Where the field is going and where we are is in this moment, is in this work that we're showcasing. And you know, I try to stay there. I try to stay with 
um, I try to stay with the interlocutors that you know I think are moving us to some place that we might not want to go. Not trying to admire us in a positionality that is always already, you know, responding to something that is long-standing and problematic. Sandra, do you want to follow up? Um, I don't really have much. Uh, other than you know enlightenment to share other than to say that the answer itself was also wonderful and <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity uh to travel the course wherever it, it may take us um in order to um kind of think past the ordinary brutalities that necessarily um make it almost impossible to to survive this hostile present so um mm-hmm mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I hear you I hear you. Okay, um, we have two more questions at this point. So um, the next one is from Calandra Warren. This is more of a personal question, but it relates somewhat to academia. But how do you maintain a sense of personal joy while engaging <laughs> in such heavy, taxing, emotional and intellectual work? <laughs> um. Um, I don't rely on the category of the human, you know, to produce, you know, all the feeling or to contain all the feeling that I have in, that I, that I can have and hold in this world. Um, you know, when I started looking in the move archive, you know, I was elated because I could, I finally found, you know, you know, African descended folks who in the 70s were thinking some of the same things I was thinking about the distinction. And so how do I maintain joy? Well, you know, I always tell people that like, you know, um, I, I'm kind of was known in my family as a happy baby. You know, the kind of baby like you just kind of leave for a while and I would get be in my own little world. Um, and so maybe that's what's happening. Maybe I just inhabit, you know, I think that, um, who is it? I think that Merleau-Ponty said, what we think is the world is actually a world. And one of the things I love about thinking with phenomenology and thinking with you know some philosophy, not all, is its capacity to have us understand that if we recognize that it's just a world and not the world, even while we're in its bullshit, we might actually diminish it um, for our own capacity to grow in other worlds or for our own capacity to see that other worlds are parallel. Um, and you know, and this book taught, took me longer than any other books to write. And that's because I insisted that if I was gonna write about hum, hum animal life, then I had to actually work with with an you know an animal outside of my home, outside of my environs. Um, I had to kind of go to that place, and this work has been really profound. Um, and so, you know, I'm thinking here with M J Alexander, you know, M J K Alexander. I'm thinking here with Alexis Pauling Gums. Um, you know, with the beauty and sustainability of a world outside of the terror um, that's formed as a world in which we, we inhabit as we go to work and we move through institutions. But yes, it is heavy and taxing, but it's also joyful because I get to talk about horses. I get to talk about the things I care about. Calandra, do you, um, do you want to follow up? Um, do you have another question? No, thank you. That was beautiful. Okay, thank you. As my as my as, a, as my mother would say, keep keeping on. <laughs> keep keeping on. Um, one last question. It looks like from Dana Smith. I was extremely interested in your discussion of reproduction in feminist and queer theories, and the way this overlaps operates in tension with race and futurity. Could you talk a little? bit more about these intersections, especially as they've changed in the years since Hammond's and Martin were writing? 
Right, right. I mean, I really bring forward this, this, this work, you know, reproduction dogged me. It wasn't as if I said, I'm going to write about, you know, this, I'm going to write about, you know, reproduction as time feminism took on reproduction. This is something that came to me from the work of blackness. And it came for, it comes forward in Hortense Spiller's work, you know, when she is talking about engendering the future, when she is talking about mother right, mother having, you know, father lacking, you know, she is engaging in um, a constellation of, um, of entities that produce generation, that produce this future. And so one of the things that I think comes forward in you know, African descended criticism and in black thought is what is the extent to which, you know, you know, like a certain kind of queer theory, you know, and I'm thinking Edelman here, which, you know, wants to repudiate the future, repudiate the child, right? And the kind of black feminist theorizing that wants to not let go of the potentiality for this future. How do we reconcile these two entities? And I think um, that, like I said, I, I think that Nash's work moves in that direction. Um, and work on motherhood. Um, I think that um, you know, Jackson, you know, again, Jackson's, you know, Jackson's work um, um, moves in that direction. I think you know that you know the book that I'm you know working that I finished and it's, and it's under contract. It's done. I'm just doing you know some last edits and going to give to the press before the first of the year. God willing and the creek don't rise, um, as they say down here. Um, and I think the work that I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to say is that, can we think for a moment about a future where the desire of that future is an embodiment, an embodiment that's been repudiated, female, reproduction, parentheses around both as something worthy of our attention and consideration, um, as something, you know, which is not the desire, the political desire for queer people to be just like heterosexuals, you know, in the establishment of their right to marriage or, you know, right to adopt. But, you know, I feel like black thought and its radicality is moving in a very different direction um, in a very, important direction, especially in this moment of climate change. How might we think about that embodiment? Um, how might we think about its insurgency, even as it brings forward the drag of gender mm -hmm. and the drag of female, which is always already there. Because while we have created a queer theory that can answer so many conundrums and questions, we have not created a queer theory that has really dealt with misogyny. What it means is and does. And I think we're on it now. And the organizing work I'm doing in our communities, in our cutie pot communities, working to affirm black transgendered um, femmes, um, um, in particular, and Black transgendered persons, we are doing that work of finally grappling with what misogyny is in this culture. So that's kind of like, you know, how, where I think we're, where I think that moment of futurity is about. Um, Dana, um, do you have another question? Um, no, thank you. That's um, exactly what I was thinking. I was like, how does how do people like Edelman and Dana Luciano and people fit like into this um, kind of mm -hmm. um, intersections that you were talking about here? So that's really helpful to think about even further that other layer of also how like black futurity itself is also inter um, intersecting with those. So thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's the last of our questions. Um, and thank you so much um, for just the amazing kind of depth and care with which you uh, responded to the questions. You've given us so much um, to think about and work with. 
Um, and um, the lecture was extraordinary. The readings, of course, and I, I think I told you this, when you first sent them to me, were really, uh, really wonderful. So it's, it's been such a pleasure to have you here. And oh, thank you. Thank you. It's been such a thank you for the invitation. I want to thank the audience that you know, I can't see you, but you know, I feel your presence in this virtual way. And thank you so much for the folks who ask questions. It's always a brave thing to ask a question. And these are difficult times. And I just want to say in closing that, you know, this has been a hard year, a hard two years. And I want to say, you know, I usually open with this, but I didn't. But I just want to say I'm sorry for your loss. Whatever that loss has been in this moment, I'm sorry. And um you know, I have, I have, you know, I'm sending you good energy, you know, in the months to come. And thank you for inviting me to your community. Thank you so much. I, I'm just sorry that you can't be here uh, in person, <laughs> but perhaps another time. And definitely. Um, all right. Thank you. And thank you, everyone in the audience as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good rest of your evening.